Warning, the following video contains a number of opinions, some of which are a bit controversial. By all means disagree, but please try to give reasoned arguments and avoid getting butt hurt. Other than that, enjoy. Hello YouTube, Miller Corner here, welcome back once again. And just recently when I was at work, I was talking with some fellow petrol head colleagues about what cars you'd buy for certain purposes, for certain budgets, or just if you wanted a kind of fun, cheap project. But as you get talking about what cars you'd buy for certain budgets with petrol heads, you find there's certain cars that you like that some people might be confused as to why you like, but there's also some cars that other people were talking quite enthusiastically about that for some reason, they just don't resonate with me, that I just don't like very much. So I thought I'd do a little video talking about popular cars that other people seem to like that I just don't. The first one is particular for those that live in the UK because we live in a country that is in love with the hot hatchback. We love small, light, powerful cars that are also practical enough to use every day. And don't get me wrong, I love hot hatchbacks. They're possibly my favourite type of car to have. And particularly in the early 2000s, there were some awesome cars about. Cars like the lightweight and fizzy Citroen Saxo VTS, the frenetic and sharp Renault Sport Clio 182, and the disappointing one, the one that I don't really like, and that is the Mark VI Ford Fiesta ST. Oh, I know, controversial, I'm sure Ford people have already jumped to the comments to call me an idiot, but I just don't like the Mark VI Fiesta ST for a number of reasons. It's not actually that powerful, not when you think about it. It's a two litre engine, 16 valve, four cylinder, with 150 brake horsepower. Reasonable, I suppose, in quite a lightweight car, but consider this. First of all, my mum's Renault Scenic People Carrier, which is by no means a performance car, has got a two litre, 16 valve, four cylinder, also with 150 brake horsepower so it's really not an impressive performance feat to have and when you look at similarly comparable cars from the era like the aforementioned Clio 182 that's got a 2 litre 16 valve 4 cylinder with 182 horsepower obviously so Renault are making 32 more horsepower that's over 20% more than what Ford are getting from the same capacity and then there's the handling all right, it's not bad, I'll grant you that. And if you look all over track days across the country, you will see Mark VI STs that are tearing up the corners and doing quite a good job. And they're usually always being overtaken by Renault Sport Clios, which are lower, sharper, and all round better when it comes to performance and cornering, because Renault Sport famously know what they're doing. I'm not saying Ford don't, but the Mark VI ST just doesn't exemplify that like some of their other hot Fords do. Then there's the biggest issue with the Mark VI ST for me, but to be fair, it's the Mark VI Fiesta in general. The way it looks, it looks so boring. It's tragically dull to look at. The ST got some bigger wheels and it got a little rear spoiler, but that's basically it. And to be perfectly honest with you, if you just got a silver one, you wouldn't really tell it apart in a crowd from the normal Mark VI Fiesta, a car that is just criminally dull to look at. The Mark VI Fiesta ST, I'm sure is a perfectly reasonable car, but compared to its competitors from the same era, I'm sorry, but it's always second or third best. Right now I've annoyed all the Ford fans in the audience, I'm now gonna start annoying all the German car fans because there's a couple of German cars that I don't really like either, starting with the Mercedes SLK. At the start, people weren't really sure this was meant to be. Yes, it had the kind of cool folding metal roof from the SL, which is fantastic. However, there were certain problems that came with that. It made it expensive, it made it complicated, and it made it extremely heavy. In fact, a modern day SLK weighs around 1.8 tonnes. That's ridiculous. A comparably sized Mazda MX-5 weighs about half that. Once you've got the weight of that heavy electric roof weighing you down, you then think, all oh, right, well, maybe you can make some of it back with some clever driving. You're going to struggle, though, because all SLKs, to my knowledge, are automatic only. They never did a manual SLK. They might have done a paddle shift one, but there was never a stick shift SLK to be released. So we can tell right away then, okay, so this isn't really meant to be a sports car then. So maybe it's kind of a premium small cruiser. You can't quite afford a Mercedes SL, so you get the SLK to cruise around, and that's kind of a cool proposition. Or at least it would be, because in around 2005, Mercedes released a version 
version of the SLK which would suggest they weren't necessarily looking at making a cruiser. The SLK 55 AMG. So what we've now got is a small car that's very heavy, only has an automatic gearbox and now we're going to put an enormous 5.5 litre V8 in it. To be fair they did improve the styling and the engine note was awesome but I just cannot see the point of a car like that. If you've got an engine like that you want either a little lightweight car without that folding metal roof to chuck around and or you kind of want a manual gearbox to make the most of it. It's too heavy, it's too expensive, it's not a proper sports car by any definitions and even if you get the top AMG variants you just get the feeling that that is an engine in a car that shouldn't really go together. The SLK is a confusing mix and I'm sorry but even in AMG variant I just can't get excited about the baby cabrio Mercedes. The next car that I really can't like is the Audi TT. And again, I'm sure all the German fans have already jumped into the comments to call me an idiot at this point, but yeah, I don't really like the Audi TT and there's a number of reasons for it. It's always been, ever since the Mark 1 TT, it's always been style over substance. It's always been designed to look as trendy as possible at the time. And I can appreciate that it is a good looking car. The Mark 1 TT is cool in a kind of retro design style way and the current TT looks fantastic. I'm not going to deny that, it genuinely looks like a baby R8 with lots of its little styling cues, the sharp lights, nice set of wheels on it. The current TT does look fantastic but it's always been about looking good first and being good second and that's largely because the TT all the way back to the Mark 1 has been based on a Golf. There's nothing wrong with that but a Golf is not necessarily where you'd start for making a sports car. Even when you look at the higher up TT such as the Mark 1 V6 Quattro where everyone will be saying ah oh, but that's a sports car but it's just a Golf R32 and it cost a lot more than a Golf R32 did. The TT has always been a Golf in a fancy frock. I know that's a cliche but it's because it's the truth with one exception that is. The current Mark 3 TT RS which is a truly astonishing astonishing car with 400 brake horsepower. It's got Audi's phenomenal twin clutch paddle shift 7 speed transmission in it and it will do 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds. It's an Audi TT for crying out loud and it's got a faster 0 to 60 time than a first generation R8 V10. And I'm going to add, I think the TT RS looks fantastic as well. The body kit they've given the RS version really sharpens it up. Those big wheels look fantastic and the exhaust note of that 5 cylinder. Oh, finally the TT has had its coming of age as more than just a sports car, I would argue the current TT RS is a baby supercar. But that's the only TT to truly resonate with me. Anything other than that, the previous generations and anything below the RS in the current generation, they're a bit style but no substance. Next we get on to some Japanese cars and I suspect these are the reasons that you clicked on this video because yep, one of the popular cars that I just cannot fall in love with is the Nissan Skyline and yep that includes the Skyline GTR, R32s, R33s and R34s. Reason one is the constant, constant association with Fast and Furious. Controversial opinion alert, I don't like Fast and Furious. I just don't like those films at all. I don't think that a certain car should be associated with a certain film franchise permanently because if you don't like the film franchise you might well end up being put off the car and to a certain degree that's what's happened with me. Next there's the tuning side of things because yes there are plenty of tuned Skylines out there. In fact I'd say probably 95% of still existing Nissan R32s, 33s and 34s have been tuned or modified or customised in some way or another, which is brilliant. I love the tuning scene, particularly the Japanese tuning scene, because there's so much going on with it. But you have to ask this, if the GTR, the R32, 3 and 4, the Skylines are so brilliant, why is there no such thing as a stock one? Why will a stock one be worth upwards of 50 grand if it's in good condition in the UK? Now you might be arguing, ah yes, but if you've got a good car and it can be tuned, you just want to make it better. But consider this, there are people that drive stock RX-7s, there are people with stock MX-5s, there are people with stock MR2s. So it's not out of the question for a heavily tunable car to be left stock by its owners because it's perfectly reasonable out of the box. And then there's the actual tuning of the cars themselves. There there are loads of people that say, oh, spend 20 grand and you can get your Skyline GTR up to 800 horsepower or 1000 horsepower or 1200 horsepower. Yes, except if you spend 20 grand on pretty much 
any car, you can get it to about a thousand horsepower. Which brings me on to the next JDM car that I don't really like that much, and it's the Mark IV Toyota Supra, the one that's by far the most popular as a result largely of Fast and Furious once again. Everyone says, oh, get a 2JZ twin turbo, tune it up, man, bring it to a thousand horsepower. But again, the amount of money it takes to get a 2JZ to run that kind of power level is quite substantial, and for that amount of money, almost any car could be making that kind of power. The Supra and the Skyline are very, very capable cars, yes. Both of them demonstrate fantastic Japanese engineering with twin turbo, compact engines, and four wheel drive. But if they're so brilliant out of the box, why aren't there more stock ones around? Why are stock Supra twin turbos and R34 Skylines so highly prized and so sought after, not just in Britain, but pretty much anywhere in the world, even in Japan? I can't really understand the obsession with these cars, and I feel like the best word I can use to describe the Skyline and the Supra are overhyped. I know we hear that a lot these days, what with people constantly fanboying over the current R35 GTR and of course the Tesla, but I think the Skyline and the Supra are heavily, heavily overhyped. If you look beyond all the tuning scene around them, there can be easily some holes picked in them. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I hate these cars. If I see a Supra that's nicely done up or an R34, I will still look over and I might even take a photo of it. But I don't lust after a Supra, I don't lust after a Skyline. I just appreciate them. They just don't really get my pulse going like a lot of other JDM cars do. It could be just me, but there's certainly no room in my dream garage for an R34 GTR or a Supra Twin Turbo. Now I appreciate that a lot of what I've said today is gonna to be highly controversial, and I imagine there's gonna be a lot of interesting comments on this video for me to read, but that's totally cool. I love that about the car community. I love how different we all are. No one likes the same thing, and that's brilliant. We've all got different ideas of what the best thing looks like, of what the best sound is, of what the best engine is, of what the best car making country is, and that is why I love cars. There are so many different options for how to have a car based lifestyle, but no matter what your favourite cars are, what you love and what you hate, we've all got one common passion and that is the wonderful world of cars. Thanks so much for watching this video everybody, I really really appreciate it. If you liked it don't forget to click that thumbs up button and also subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you will be notified when a new Miller Corner video is released. But for now thanks once again so much for watching everybody and have a brilliant rest of your day. See you soon and have a good one.